Let us serenade you on the 250th episode of Better Buddies. Cause we're living, living in the moment, the moment. So don't look back, it's a long, long road ahead. A long, long road ahead. Woo! Hello, and welcome back to Better Buddies. I'm your host, RJ, and this week we've got John. Hello. And James. Hello. And Calvin. That's me. And for our 250th episode, we've got a real humdigger of an icebreaker for you. <sighs> our Better Buddies icebreaker. How could carousels be spiced up so they are more exciting? Pyrotechnics. Make the horses breathe fire. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> that would be nice. spicy. That might be just the way. I like it. Simple, but dynamic. Memorable. Exactly. I would say. Well, it's one I mean, of those like things you can, is... like, you can measure that, right? So you can make sure it's safe, because nobody's supposed to get off the horse while they're riding the ride. No, that's not fun. That's, that's... lame. <laughs> so there you go. That's how you spice it up. You just allow people to walk around on the carousel while it's moving. <laughs> walk on, Ooh. walk off. Yeah. You, it never stops, and you speed it up. See, now I'm thinking about, like, that second story, six Fl- like, the two-story carousel at Six Flags Great America. And like, if they just didn't have safety rails, and you could just get up and get on and off whenever, mm-hmm. jump down into the fountain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That pond is that like a foot uh... deep. Don't jump in that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you could do that, or you could add real horse smells. Oh. <laughs> the sensation of hot horse breath on your back. Oh, horse God, shit the comes out you. of a horse. I hate that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> John. <laughs> I just went from your number one fan to your nemesis. That's no, just... no, no, no. <laughs> like, every, like, every third horse on the third go-around, a, a flap opens on the horse, and some horse shit just falls out. Yeah, yeah. but it should shoot out, like, a t-shirt from a t-shirt cannon. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> just oh, nail God. some, like, small child in the face <laughs> and send some cartwheeling backwards. Hey, what's the matter? You love carousels, honey. <laughs> Hey kids, there's a carousel here. Let's get on. Daddy, Daddy, what's that horse doing? <laughs> oh, guys, in my eyes. It's not even realistic. This isn't natural. <laughs> the dad turns and there's the kids like clearly hold like the dad turns. The kid's holding his face, but like on the ground is one of the eyes. The shit just moved that fast. <laughs> Takes the head off of the horse behind it. It's like, ooh, okay, well, maybe we gotta recalibrate that a little bit. Ooh, you carousel, but everybody gets a soft gun, uh, an airsoft gun. Oh, now that's fun. So you gotta stay on the horse, but also shoot at the people in front of you and behind you. I think it should be like, uh, like, I think it should be a carousel, but where you put your hands specifically, um, it just mass doses you with LSD and (laughs) just drives you 10 minutes long. By the time you get off, you have no idea like who you are, where you are, what you are. You're just like, it's the, it's the ride you, you sell it as the ride that will change your life. (laughs) 10 minutes. That's all it takes. Accurate. <laughs> the, the carousel yeah. gets done, and the operator's like, "All right, everyone, please exit the carousel." And a bunch of people are just like sitting there, staring at the back of their horse. Don't you get it, man? You can't get off the carousel. It's all the carousel, <laughs> man. Nay, nay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a horse. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a little darker. That's definitely like a. Uh... Kind of grody. What's like a fun one? What's like a fun like a not fun? Yeah, those are all fun. What's like a? I mean, kid friendly adaptation. I guess the horse spells the closest we have. So I think far. what you. I think sorry. if you want to make it extreme, you gotta go <laughs> the Toy Story Mania route ride at Disney World, where mm. you literally sit down in a cart and you got the <clears> little <throat> blaster thing that you push the button and they have a bunch of projector screens like tracking where you shoot. And you do a bunch of carnival rides where you shoot at stuff. 
but as you like ride through it's not fast you just kind of go through in your little cart and you shoot the stuff on the screen and that's it like there's no animatronics there's no nothing but it's a great ride carousel the same way you get on the carousel you ride your horse you got your infrared cowboy pistol and you shoot at stuff projected on the screens yeah i know what you're saying i like that would they like all be in the middle I yeah, think you can do middle question. or the outside is covered in the screen. Now, of course, this would be then an indoor carousel, not outdoor, because, you know, you don't want the outdoor light to make it impossible to see the screen. So it'd be like this big house with the inside just rotates. Like That's the that. That World of Tomorrow ride at Disney World, aren't they? <laughs> there go. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> I think... <laughs> If we want extreme, why don't we just put a carousel on, like, a monster truck frame and just, like, drive it around and stuff like that? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Put it in the middle of a monster truck rally. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. And it's, and we put all the ideas together. So All of them. Yeah, a carousel, like... (laughs) So uh, you walk into this carousel, and you because it's dark inside, because it's an indoor carousel, so you can see the screens to do the shooty rooty tooty, and you hear the roar of the monster trucks, because it's on the monster truck wheels, and that's all you know. And you hear other monster trucks driving around, but you don't know where the fuck they are, because you're inside a house. Yeah, it's... And then it stinks because there's shit shooting at you. (laughs) There's shit shooting everywhere. There's real authentic horse smell being pumped in. The horses breathe (laughs) fire randomly. (laughs) You're being mass-dosed with at least 12 (laughs) times the recommended starting amount of LSD. (laughs) That's, like... That's that's an amazing... That that is like you will you will either yeah you will either survive or you will die based on that. <laughs> That's some ego death right there, eh? That is some real cult ego death. Yeah. <laughs> Just look, you've all tried sensory deprivation. We're going for sensory overload. <laughs> if you overload all Other the senses, parks. they all short out. Other theme parks promise you a day you'll never forget. We'll promise you a day you'll want to forget, but can't, <laughs> ever. <laughs> they say trauma sticks with you for a lifetime. We're going to find out. <laughs> and now with a chance. camera system, with an automatic camera powered and calibrated by ChatGPT, we can now pinpoint the exact moment of ego death with Chinese facial recognition software and send you a 2 by 4 glossy photo for the whole family <laughs> to enjoy. Glossy photos cost twenty four ninety nine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the first uh, person who needs to go to therapy due to our ride gets to come free for the rest of our openings. Oh no, that's how we lose money, RJ. Uh, the, only the first person who has to go to therapy. It's one person. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a promotional. Like you got to be the first person that has to go to therapy because of this. And if the therapist is like, "Nah, you already come to therapy," that don't count. This ride has to oh, make man. you realize there's something wrong with your life. <laughs> it's not even that. This ride will break every frame of perception, of, like, reference and perception that you have. It's called the ego death. It's going to <laughs> yeah. shatter everything that you know. And it's possibly going to shatter a part of your body, but we are not responsible for that. It's part of our new theme park, Philosophy or... World, Philosophy World yeah. USA. <laughs> philosophy world usa yeah as opposed to philosophy wanna... world china philosophy world tokyo and philosophy world paris i like this franchise yeah coming soon to 2026 <laughs> philosophy world dublin i want to go to the pushing a boulder up a hill ride <laughs> oh the kids love that one with real boulders yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. real boulders <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that's part of our kitty land area, because if you're still dealing with that problem, you're a child intellectually. <laughs> <laughs> Brutal. But first, you have to solve the allegory of the cave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, that's the entrance. That's how you yeah. get in. Yeah. 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 Actually, we the, the, the whole theme park is the cave it's not in a cave but it is the cave like no you're giving away the james james James. you're right you're right you're right i'm sorry i'm sorry never mind if they can't solve that then they can never leave 
<laughs> yes. And well, this is what we in the biz uh, call edutainment. <clears throat> like, Therefore, we're getting like the, the schools that, to come on trips. I'd like to think that Plato's Cave is really just, uh, like, the only music. Like, they're just, like, speakers like they have in, like, Disneyland attractions. And it's, they're just pumping in 24 hours a day Hotel California in Plato's <laughs> Cave. Oh, I was... just like, wow. This is the best sound in the world. I was thinking there would be, like, areas where it'd just be like, <clears throat> remember that you will die. <laughs> no, because Plato's Cave, the whole thing about Plato's Cave is that reinforces your, uh, your well, like, you're supposed to love the cave. The, the cave is multi-layered, though, James. Like, it, at this point, we yeah. gotta talk, we gotta talk some structural theming of the park. Plato's, the entire park is Plato's Cave, but also the children's area starts with Plato's Cave. And then, yes. you know, you gotta get to other parts, you know. There's other philosophies we have to incorporate. It's true. Nobody really loves the rain, the Ayn Rand section, but they insist we keep it. <laughs> yeah, a bunch of Joe Rogan fans and like fascist women hanging out in the Ayn Rand section. <laughs> Either the hottest or the ugliest people you'll ever see go to Ayn Rand World, <laughs> which is really just like. Uh, well, I don't actually know. No, no, I've never a, read all... any of Ayn Rand. Oh, I can tell you exactly what's in the Ayn Rand world, uh, which may okay. say more about me than anything. Um, but it's a bunch of build-it-yourself rides because, you know, you have to take oh. life into your own hands and yeah. everyone needs to just be their best selves, work together cooperatively, uh, and agree, like, oh, like, let's negotiate as good, morally upright individuals and come to an agreed-upon situation. On all things. As individuals. Sounds about right. Sounds like Anne Rand. I would I think it should just be like a And then of course no none of the attractions ever get built. They're all just too busy discussing well which height should it be at and which attraction yeah. should we build first and trying to do it on their own and not being able to collaborate on anything because everybody has different ideas on how it should function. Yeah, it, it should just be a sticky note on the ground that says, like, if you were really self-motivated, this would be your theme park. You would have built this already. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> you have to earn it. There's also um, no park services available in that section because, you know, yeah, that's a handout. That's socialism, dude. That's, yeah. That's a no-no. That's big. That's the big brother stepping in. That's big. That's big gov. Fire and police yeah. don't go there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the experience. It is part of the experience. That's why we have so many waivers. Yeah, just a waiver for each. Yeah, it's the, it's literally like the size of a phone book. I feel like if you could, like, I feel like this is definitely, like, it's a little artsy and experimental. I don't really... Who would be the mascots? Would just be a bunch of, like, it'd be like Plato and Rand. I think it'd Nietzsche, just be a question mark. Kierkegaard... I think it's Questy the question mark. Questy the question mark? Yeah. We're always asking why. I kind of dig it. I can see it. I, I, It should be Questy the question mark, and he's, like, made out of Play-Doh. Like, he can take any any shape, basically. Yeah. He's like, yeah. It's kind of like the uh, like the dino DNA guy from, uh, from Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I dig that. So, uh, any venture capitalists out there listening, we're ready. We will we will manage this philosophy themed theme park. It's gonna be great. It's gonna make all the also, money. I, I do yeah. have to say, just based on what was sent in chat, um, we need to make a rave section somewhere. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> they haven't like made something called Plato's Rave like somewhere. There's got to be somewhere and some. Well, right here. Yeah. That's right here. <laughs> so that, that's the adult section. You're always right? in. The, you're always in the rave. That's the secret. <laughs> There's Plato's allegory of the cave for the children, and then once you turn yeah. 21, you can go to Plato's allegory of the rave. Yeah, Plato's allegory of the rave, and it's just an empty warehouse, and it's like, no, you don't understand. It's about the idea of a rave. <laughs> it's about. It's about the. It's about the. You know, what's the most ideal form of a rave? Yeah, this is it. Yeah. Cool. 
Our next segment is Better Buddies Recommend, where we recommend a piece of media to enjoy. Who would like to start? I have one that is a good segue. Hell yeah. There we go. Um, there's a long, kind of long-running comic strip on the internet called Existential Comics. Okay. Uh, yes. James has apparently heard of this, but it it's just like, if you have some level of rudimentary philosophy training, um, it's just very ironic and funny. And then there's like a little explanation at the bottom about what's actually going on. So it's accessible, um, but it basically just That's borrows funny. like philosophers from throughout history and puts them in weird situations together. Uh, it's pretty entertaining. Existential comics. I, I just went to the front page and I appreciate their counter at the top. They have been 276 days without a Kant's and Kant's pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Where'd you find them initially, John? Uh, probably <clears throat> Facebook. Um, I used to like read a different one that was like Saturday morning breakfast cereal, and they collaborated every once in a while, too. So. Oh my God! They have a, uh, one of the um, when you Google it, one of the options is to click the Dungeons and Dragons. It's Dungeons and Dragons and Philosophers, featuring Simone de Beauvoir as the Dungeon Master Extraordinaire. The ambiguity of her adventures leads to anxiety, but ultimately authentic freedom. Jean-Paul <laughs> Sartre is a level 6 warrior chaotic good who wields the amunet of phenomenology, which brackets metaphysical questions and undead. Immanuel Kant is Sir Imperatus, level 10 paladin. Uh, once lied to save a child from an evil ogre, and he still feels badly about it. Foucault uh, uh, is yeah. a level 5 rogue and can give a genealogical account of why he picked your pocket. And Jacques <laughs> Derrida is a level 9 wizard who re deconstructs his enemies with a deadly combo of semantic analysis and fireballs. Fireball. Oh god, not semantic analysis. <laughs> give me the fireballs, please. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good grief. I love that type of stuff. Does anybody here have like a? Uh, I know, I know, philosophy is like so heady, but does anyone here have like a favorite philosopher or somebody they've really? Oh man, it's not within reach. My my philosophy book isn't in aren't in reach. Um, where's the only like actual philo ph like philosophy books that I've read have been um. Both were, uh, what was it, Stoicists. So it was Aurelius, Marcus Aurelius, and um, what's the other dude? I lent you his book. Seneca. Seneca, yeah. Seneca, yeah. Those are the only two, like, philosophy books that I've read. I have read, I read this book on Zen philosophy um, called The Way of the Warrior, and it's by this, it's like a modern take on Zen philosophy, but it incorporates a lot of Christian and theological thought into it, and the guy's argument is like, Here's all of the Zen philosophy, and also if you're afraid of this because you're Christian, like, I'm a Christian too, and the one, being one with the universe, well, that universe is just another name for God. So you're fine, go be one with the universe. Um, and then I, in the last year, I read a book, and I think I recommended it, but it was um, Plato and a Duck Walk Into a Bar. And it's a comedic, like, it travels kind of through the history of philosophy and through a bunch of different philosophers, kind of evolving, like, okay, there was this way of thinking, and then this was the predominant school, and then this was the predominant school up to the modern day. But the entire time it was, like, telling jokes that emphasized that philosophical school of thought. Um, <clears throat> one of them being, like, two turtles mug a snail... And the police talk to the snail, and he's like, I don't know what to tell you, officers. It all happened so fast. Relativism. That's, um, that's a good dad joke. That's a smart dad joke, too. Yeah. It's like a horny smart dad tells that. So, I... <clears throat> and I did... I have read Ayn Rand. I don't think she's the end-all, be-all. I had a phase. Um, but I did genuinely enjoy reading Atlas Shrugged and looking more into... Uh, her way of thinking, her way of looking at the world and how it was influenced by her time in communist Russia. Um, biggest flaw being it presupposes uh, those who are moral are infallib infallibly so. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I will say just from like the loose stuff I know about her, because I've never read any of her books, and she's kind of a favorite like punching bag in that like field um, or in that area. Yeah, whatever you want to call it, that yeah. area of thought. But um, I do know that like Bioshock like borrows a lot from her ideas. Bio... Like, it, like... Well, Bioshock pulls heavily and is pulled kind of the sense of like this is what the end point would be yeah if a bunch of yeah. people fucked off to the bottom of the ocean or in into a secret valley and we're like we're we're no gods no kings only man man can deal with each other in a rational manner and needs nothing needs none of this and then realizes like oh shit we need some level of structure and also we probably shouldn't lock ourselves in the bottom of the fucking ocean yeah man yeah. uh, as long as I'm entitled to the sweat of my own brow and a good set of golf clubs, I'm good to go. <laughs> spoken like uh, spoken like a, a true disciple of Mr. Ryan himself. <laughs> it's also very much an uh, examination of its time, right? Because this is like, this is back when the big industry tycoons we talked about were steel and railroads and yeah. oil and copper. And it's like, yeah, people are more digital age these days. And also the con corporations you're referring to are so internationally embedded and so fucking massive that you literally need, like, every stroke of luck to hope to stand against them. Yeah, I think she was... Because, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but basically her... Like, the a core part of her philosophy, and this is just being, like basing it off of like some of the loose stuff i've read from her like little pieces of essays or quotes i've literally just seen online plus like parts of her wikipedia page but she's very much like it's the like the industrious people of the world are the ones who make the world go around everybody else and this is a very basic simpli simplification but like that industrious quality their desire to like create or you know build is what makes them moral people um, most other people don't share this quality, therefore the industrious have like a place superior to those who don't um, and titles them to a kind of like independence, I guess. No, or no? Y yes, <clears throat> for the most part, you're like 80% of the way there. Um, it's that there's basically like three types of people. There are, like you said, the industrious people, but I think innovator would be a better word where no matter what happens, their nose to the grindstone, they're working hard. Um, I think the best example is her Henry Reardon in Atlas Shrugged. He's a steel tycoon, um, but he knows how to do the jobs of every job at his factory. So, like, when there's a leak on one of the vats and molten steel is, like, spilling out of the floor, he's down, he rolls up his sleeves and he's down there chucking the clay at it to seal the leak from a distance safely. Like, he's, he knows how to do all the things. And invented a new alloy of steel that is super steel. And, but if he lost it all, he's an industrious individual who'd be like, okay, well, I'm starting over and I'm putting in the hard work and the sweat and the dedication to do the thing. But, again, it goes back to her, the moral people are moral in all ways. He's also a good boss who makes sure he pays his workers appropriately because, you know, that if he's got unhappy workers who can't live off the job he's provided them, he won't have workers. Um, and then there's the facilitators, the assistants, the next level, the, this like, almost like a yeah, support class. Like existential where, middle map, basically. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think a great example <clears throat> is in, if anybody saw the Daredevil, remembers the Daredevil TV show, Wesley was the Kingpin's assistant where it's like, these are the people who do the like day in, day out, like lower than in charge work. And they're dedicated, they're good at it, they understand that what they do makes a difference and they matter, but they can't break the system. They're too entrenched in the system. Uh, there's a character in the book who, when everything goes to shit and shuts down, he's stuck, he basically ends up uh, stranded on a train that breaks down, and he doesn't know how to fix the train, but he knows what the levers are supposed to do to make the train go, and he gets, he kind of goes a little nuts trying to be like, no, I gotta keep the engine moving, and he keeps trying to make it start going again, because if the engine stops, that means the world has stopped. Um, and then there's the moochers, the leeches, the everybody who just says, ah, I'm, why do you not give? The 
in a, um in Bioshock, it's the the state and the church. The we're entitled to the sweat of your brow. We're entitled to the output of your work. Which you know, those are the ultimate evil in her books. So you can see the appeal, and you can see like the rationale. I don't think she's entirely wrong. I think, but the problem is, is like. It's simplification, uh, I think, is the biggest problem. It's major simplification, and it's still rooted in, in my opinion, in, like, the material. Like, the that's the same issue with, like, uh, ironically, like, the issue that a lot of those <clears throat> the st- systems of thought that reacted to communism have the same problem that communism itself has, which communism itself, you could make the case, it's a reaction to capitalism, or something like it because like uh the uh, they don't reach for anything higher like for them there is nothing greater than like man the conception of it it like it isn't there so all of their ideas stay very much like on the ground which isn't a bad thing like aristotle was like plato's complement basically and in many ways he exceeded plato because he dealt like in that famous painting, the School of Athens with all the philosophers, super cliche, like art slash philosophy thing to point out. But like Plato's pointing up because he's like, oh, the realm of ideas and we have to think about what's higher and blah, blah, blah. And Aristotle is pointing ahead with like a flat hand because he's basically trying to tell Plato like, no, like we have to think about what like the here and now, like w- what we can actually do here, we can't just spend all day with our heads up in the clouds. We have to actually do real things. And that's why, like, usually Aristotle is cited as, like, the the, the father of all sciences. Because yeah. he was the first person who really, like, started getting stuff to... He wasn't the first person, but he's really seen as, like, the codifier of that. So, in a way, like, it's a hyper-Aristotelian, like, it set is. of beliefs, but... But it's like codified with like political thought, which always is like really volatile to work with. It's definitely not anti like thought or anti idea, but it is the like, okay, artists shouldn't be paid just because they say they're artists. Like, okay, if people like your art, then that's fine. But Mm. if you're, if you're writing shit poems, that doesn't mean you should get paid for it. Like, yeah, that's, I think that's fair. That's, uh, I hate to be a dick but that's those are uh and in a similar so way that's times. the the academic aspect too is the like yeah it's it's totally fine to be an academic if you're actually like doing science and not just saying you're an academic if you're actually like doing academic pursuits but again yeah, and everyone i think everyone has the <clears throat> potential to do that in their own way and like societies need to be free and open enough to like foster that ability in people while still being sort of like having firm enough parameters to say like you do actually have to like it has to be oriented towards something like you do have to believe in something you have to be trying and putting something in the world um to a degree uh yeah i think that's probably the issue i don't know if like rant's philosophy has like a like a genealogical basis like she's saying like you either are born as like an innovator or you are not like no. there's no way for you no it's not that. in that it's more in the are you t- it's um, it's almost like the take pull yourself up by your bootstraps right are you choosing to do this mm-hmm. you have a choice mm-hmm. to be better just go be better um and but it, it also kind of breaks down a little bit when it's like Oh, the dude who directed movies is now running the apple cart because he's like, well, I'm, we haven't started a cinema yet here in our little valley, but, and I needed to start raising the funds to start making movies again. So I'm running this apple cart and it's a successful apple cart because since I know how to make movies, I know how to sell apples. Yeah. Which is very, uh, non, non platonic or non Socratic, I should say. Like there's, uh believe that just because you know how to do one thing well knows means that you know obviously like with some of those examples it's supposed to be funnily enough it's supposed to be the ideal form of those types of people like if they if it was just if they represent the ideal of that type of person they would naturally just be able to do all of that but the problem is is that like we don't really have many people ever who fulfill that ideal so if you fill a bunch of people's heads with like 
oh, because I can make stuff, that means that I'm, like, better than everybody else. That's how you get, like, you will get industrialists and, and people like that, but you also get, like... Musk. Like, I think... Yeah, exactly. You get, like, technocrats, and you get, like, people who are convinced, like, oh, because I make a lot of money, or because I know how to make movies, or because I know how to do X, Y, and Z so well, that confers, like, a morality to me, when it's like, yep. I don't know, you can, like, you can actually achieve a lot by being immoral, uh, and look like it's moral. You might not even know, and you know, so... She like, also touches on that a little bit, too, <laughs> with, like, that comes into the people who, like, assume, well, I... I deserve to be in charge or I deserve to make decisions. I deserve yeah. to be taken care of because like, well, I'm, I'm a scientist or I'm an academic. I'm a professor. I'm a wealthy individual. I deserve to be in charge or I deserve to make decisions. Um, when it's kind of like, no, just because you're, just because you're fucking famous, you, you don't get to, doesn't make you right. But yeah, no, it's a really cool uh, webcomic you found, John. <laughs> yeah, I love that stuff. Who wants to go next? Oh. I'll, I'll go. go. Calvin you volunteers. I'll, because I got nothing, but I'll keep it on the train of uh, philosophy. I Ooh. sent this to James last night. Um, <laughs> but I found this... Um, thought experiments uh called the F floating man thought experiments uh by i believe his name is ibn sina okay um he's a persian philosopher Ooh. and basically um i just thought it was an interesting idea uh so i would recommend reading up on it but the gist of it is it's a thought experiment to prove the idea of a soul Ooh. um and the concept is if you imagine a man who like spontaneously comes into existence floating in the air, but there is no movement of wind. So he cannot perceive that he is in the air. His limbs are all like spread apart. So you're not touching yourself. So you're not literally, you're not touching anything and he can't see, hear, smell, taste, nothing. So he has no sensory input. He just like appears floating in the air would the man still perceive himself as in existence? Uh, I think we can answer that. Maybe. No, you can't because if, if you're going to say like, deprivation tanks. Yes, but you know, um, the idea is that uh, you, even if you deprive yourself of senses now, you already have established a sense of self. So the purpose of this experiment is that he spontaneously comes into existence so in he, sensory de deprivation. Can he develop so a sense he is, of self with no external input? Yes. So you're, he's never perceived or touched anything. And with a continued lack of sensory prep, um, perception, would he still be self-aware and able to think about himself? And if he does, then does that does he breathe? argue for the existence of a soul? Presumably, he breathes. You're you're getting too technical with it. It's it's yeah, it's it's, it's more abstract. If like he breathes, part, it's kind he of... has a soul. That's where I'm going. <laughs> Fair and enough. If she I breathes, she's a thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's a <laughs> thought. <laughs> Uh, no, where'd you no. find this where'd you where'd you it, find this like i know it's on wikipedia but like how did yeah. you come about this again um it was just like an offhand mess uh, mention in a tv show that i was watching and i was just like um i'm just gonna look that up because like what the heck uh what is it? it it's literally just an offhand comment never addressed it means nothing hmm. and i and i just kind of looked it up because it sounded interesting I still so think there's awesome. a way to figure it out. This is a puzzle. It's not a puzzle. It's more no, it's just a puzzle, like a. It's, it's sort of like a proof of concept for consciousness. Break out the way. jigsaw it's table. Just, like in a way, you have to think of your own consciousness as that floating man, basically. Like, but there's a level of separation have... between you and. 
we also have senses beyond the physical. Our sense of balance. Our sense of where That's things physical. are in the world. But, like, beyond, like, touch, taste, the the basic five, you know? So Yeah, but it's... Uh, I think it's difficult because you still draw it's difficult, reference. But... You know... I'm pretty sure even people who, like, literally cannot feel, like, they have that con- medical condition, are still mm-hmm. aware when they breathe. But so they're, they're, they're getting external physical stimuli, which breaks the concept yeah. of this thought experiment. The point is that he basically, he kind of has a body, but it's not really a body. Like, he is fully independent of anything that would so be So a ball of like flesh a- appears, a-, a brain in a jar appears. Is it alive? It, is it well, aware? That- this is this is like a variation, or this is actually yeah. like the original of that brain in a jar. Like, if you, how would you know if you were just a brain in a jar or something like that? But this is more like a, it's more of like a, uh, yeah, like a philosophical take on like, because it's like it's saying forget not just the material, but forget all prior like input. Basically, forget everything you know, and we'll give you these very basic starting points. So it's a guy who's like floating; he can't touch anything, he can't perceive. Like, it might even be wrong to, to, like, pronoun this person because they're just kind of a consciousness that exists, like, floating. In a yeah, ball like, of flesh. So the, break, the breakdown of the three points are the floating man is conscious of the existence of his soul without being conscious of the existence of his body. Uh, the floating man validates the existence of his soul without validating the existence of his body. And when the floating man is taken out of his body, all that left is his soul, which is validated in itself. So it's, you don't have any perception of anything. Do you still have thought and are you still able to identify yourself? And his argument is that, that therefore a soul is immaterial yet, uh, like physical or like still real. Cool. Hell yeah. I just think, I think it's like, I, I was like, I skimmed through the Wikipedia article and I want to read it more in depth later, but I thought just like from the little bits that I read, I was like, this is such like a, it's like so simple, but it's such a great, such a unique little idea. Like it's so, I love the visual and I love like the the concept of it because I think it almost like defies concepts, but also validates them at the same time. Like I love (laughs) stuff like that. That's so paradoxical. I, I love stuff that like, breaks your ability to talk about it and and i like was geeking out when uh yeah when i saw it it was great yeah cool. he wrote this around 1000 ce is the modern way to write ad right yeah, yeah. Uh, I common guess. era yeah. yeah okay yeah. so then yeah ad i'm just not gonna be able to change my mind from it being ad i didn't um, know they changed so, it yeah. Yeah, because it's tech, it's rooted in Christianity to say AD, BC. Yeah. It's funny, though. They changed the words, but they didn't change the actual dates. So they well, still defined the common era as the birth of Christ. Look, a lot of books would have had to be republished, all right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, that's funny. That's really funny. Did you know that the, that, like, uh, the Jewish people have their own calendar basically it's like the year 5000 in like the jewish calendar there's a number of calendars out la di da for them i mean it's yeah. currently it, it's currently year six of this era in japan how many eras have there been one for each emperor oh shit oh shit so on official documents i have to write uh like sometimes they want you to write the uh, year as the uh, um, like for the rest of the world does for like tw- uh, 2024 um, that's Gregorian right yeah. yeah yeah so sometimes you have to write the Gregorian date other day other times on more official stuff you have to write the Japanese date which the month and day are the same but the year is different so um, this is currently Reiwa 6 and they named the era not after the uh emperor but based on the emperor so this was reiwa before it was heisei then it was showa and then it was taisho meiji wow yeah so cool i wonder how that's represented like technology wise his dates are always kind of thorny 
It is, um, but Google Translate actually will translate if you put the date as like Rewa 6, Google Translate's actually usually pretty good and will translate that as 2024. Cool. Which I find interesting. But yeah, no, I imagine that makes their date time calculations for their Japanese programmers so much worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those poor guys. Uh, but yeah, so that was my little, we were already talking about philosophy, so I figured I'd add one more. Hell yeah. Well, my recommendation is going to sound really dumb in the face of all that. I'm just recommending Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, specifically uh, World of Light, the single player mode, because that's what I've been playing since I bought it on Saturday. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've played a lot more Kirby main than I ever thought I would in my life. Oh, God. <laughs> and Why? as I'm, well, so the, the World of Light single player mode basically starts off with all the fighters standing on the cliffside looking up at this villain Galim or whatever. Galem. I don't know. Fucking Galeem. something. Galim, yeah. Galim. Uh, and a whole horde of master hands and crazy hands coming down out of the sky. And the fighters are like, oh, we can take them. We'll, we'll have to defeat about ten each. And then Galim is like, yeah, fuck that. Uh, and all the master hands turn into beams of light that shoot after the fighters. Turn them back into statues. And Kirby hops in a star and is flying away. And it's actually kind of funny watching them all fail so utterly. Because, like, Captain Falcon tries to jump into his blue flyer and just, instant. Doesn't even make it in the car. Um, Falco is flying in one of the R-wings from Star Fox and does, like, two barrel rolls and then gets taken out. Uh, I think Lucario makes, like, two jumps and then dies. Like, nobody is safe. Nobody gets out. Except for Kirby on his stupid fucking star. And he's just outrunning all of it. And then he pops out of existence at the last minute. So it looks like he got got, but he didn't. And Galeem remakes the world. And traps the spirits of all the characters from all those video games in the world. And then you as Kirby are the only one left. And you have to go around collecting the spirits to help you in your fight. And freeing them. And then freeing the fighters. Um... It's really kind of neat the way they'll, like, pick certain fighters and then adjust some of the stats on the fight to try and get close to the representation of who the sticker is. So, like, the Venusaur sticker was you fought a giant Ivysaur from the Pokemon trainer. Or some of the, like, uh, there's one where it's, like, a, it's called Chorus. It's these three, like, singers. So they have three Jigglypuffs and their main strategy is to just sing. Which is a fucking pain in the ass because you, <laughs> you, 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 all three of them sing. like, And it's a flat stage, so there's nowhere for you to run, really. So if you've hit the ground, they all gang up on you and sing one after another so that you cannot get up. Um, but because you start as Kirby, you have to like traverse the map and uh, like beat the fights along the paths in order to keep progressing around the map. And, like, find the different fighters. And I think I've only unlocked... I've unlocked Mario, Donkey Kong, Marth... Marth? Whoever the Probably. fuck. Yeah, Marth. Um, Kirby, Olimar, and I think that's it. Yeah, that's all I've unlocked so far in the uh, single-player mode. That's yeah, kind of similar to the maze in um, Brawl. Where you have to fight the person to unlock them. Oh yeah. My God. Oh, that's right. Dude, having to retrace your steps in Brawl was fucking murder. It's not as bad as that. It's uh, definitely very different. It's mostly just I don't remember fights. Brawl being There's that no bad. Lego Brawl. I kind of like that. At the end. <laughs> yeah, having to like backtrack basically through everything because you got to find your way out. I'm like, I don't know. I was like, I was, I did not have the patience nor the like conceptual skills to get through it easily i was a kid um they also have like hazards on the map or areas you have you can only unlock if you unlock certain spirits that assist you so it's a little bit of a pain in the ass that way where it's like oh cool i can't go this way okay i guess i'll just follow every other path available to me and turn when i hit barriers until i finally find something that lets me get through an area I think it took me like twenty oh, sorry, hours sorry, to beat. I think it took me like twenty hours to beat or so. Dang. 
Yeah. Is it like how does it compare to the other like story modes of the other games? Did Melee uh, even have a story mode? It had an adventure yeah. mode, but no like narrative. Brawl's the only one with a narrative. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, World of Light is closer, but there's no like overworld levels or anything. It's all just fights on stages. Well, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. I say that. Um, later on, there's like some sub areas that are kind of overworldy. So, but it, it's not like a cohesive narrative quite like Brawl is. There's Brawl overarching a... like, yeah. the game is bad, but that's pretty much it story wise. Like. Galeem is bad, and I'm guessing the next amount of story I'll get is You defeated Galeem! Congratulations! No spoilers. Oh, shit! No spoilers. <laughs> it's is... not that, though. <laughs> yeah, it's just... So Galeem makes, like, a new world, basically? Yeah, it's, yeah. like, a composite world, so, like... And it's a composite world of, like, all the stages you can play in the game, but on an overworld map so like oh the um in pokemon x and y the paris themed city like that's a city you quote unquote wander through or the bunker from solid snake the le- the bunker level from solid snake is like a secret bunker area facility but it's you remember those uh children's rugs that's the cars like yeah. the roads in the town yeah yeah the map yeah, yeah. is like that yeah, it is. It's basically like that, analogy. but video games. So yeah, yes. having fun. It's Smash Bros. So you know, it's. Who's uh, your? I forget who are your like regular mains. Who's your Pikachu. main bro? Pikachu's That's my main. Like your... uh, and then I like playing with Fox and Pit. Um. Used to like Lucario, but I haven't really played it as much anymore. Uh, I really have liked the times I've played him. I liked playing as Steve for Minecraft, and I still need to buy the DLCs. Um, but Steve is such a technical fighter because you have to literally, like, you have to avoid everybody so that you can press B to mine resources. And then if you mine, you will eventually get iron and then gold and then diamond. Which makes your... And then you have to go back to your crafting table and hold, like, A to get till the bar fills up to craft your sword up from wood all the way to diamond. And then your attacks will do more damage and be stronger, but you have to, like, avoid getting your ass kicked while you do that. You could also, like, lay... Like, run minecarts into people similar to... Kind of similar to, like, Wario's motorcycle... Um, but again, you need, like, some level of resources to do that. <laughs> or you just can't. Yeah, I think you need an iron at least to do that. So, and it's it's a strong fighter. Like, overall, it's very versatile. Um, you get the elytra wings to, like, glide you to safety. Uh, or kill you. <laughs> or kill you. <laughs> Which more often happens. I found they weren't too bad. You just really gotta time it right, because they take you, like, straight up and then almost straight down. Yeah. I do. So I've been doing some quick little possible name research here. You want to see what I've uh, found so far? For what? I think it's interesting. For Galeem. Because, oh. like, the, uh, the, the story, even though there's not much of a narrative, like, that's very uh, evocative of, like, uh, like, Gnosticism. Like the, which is like a sub branch of like both Christian and like Judaic thought. And it stems from like the very early days of both religions. Basically, the belief in there is that uh, there's this overwhelming light force that's like the true God. But what ended up happening in the Gnostic theology is that a piece of that God broke off because it wanted to make its own world. So it kind of went over to a place where God couldn't see it. Or just broke off and it made its own world um and this little god is called the the demiurge um and he filled the world with like all of the stuff that we know so basically the demiurge made the, like we don't live in the world that, that is the real god the real god is outside of our world and we're inside basically the toy chest of this like sub god called the demiurge who put us all there 
to kind of just hang out. There's more insidious reasons. I think but James is spoiling like... it. Well, we'll see. I I don't know the story of this, but we're we're also like uh, it also sounds similar to the the themes of like Scientology, honestly, which is really funny. But I think Scientology <laughs> probably borrows more from Gnosticism. Point being, I was looking up like when you said that. Like I was like, oh man, that's that's really interesting. So I was looking at the word uh, at like the wiki for Galim. And, like some people are like, oh, his name is just supposed because Galim looks like a biblical angel. It's like a series yeah. of wings around like an old one, basically. Um, it looks like an angel from Evangelion, honestly. Um, and uh, I was looking up like apparently his Japanese name is uh, Kira, which is either like. According to the very quick Google uh, research from Gemini, it's um, it's either and it, just their kind of like English uh, transliteration, English to Japanese transliteration of killer, uh, or it also means Ooh. like kira kira means like glittering or shining. I don't know if that how accurate that so is. So it's a just what double I mean. meaning uh, because like he killed all yeah. the fighters, and then he's yeah, also like gleaming light, glittering, yeah, shining. Yeah. Oh. Glittering, shining death, but fun thing too, Galim, because I was like, that sounds like an old Hebrew word. And I looked it up, and while the name is different, there is a Hebrew word, like, it looks like Gollum, but I think you would pronounce it Galim, because it's G-A-L-L-I-M. So it might be a combination of the hard A and the soft A, like Galim. But uh, what that means is basically that's a reference to the passage where, like, uh, they make it out of the desert or something like that. And I think it's either Moses or Joseph ends up dying. And they say that like, oh, you're like, you're going to be buried. Basically, I want to be buried in the hills of my ancestors. And Galim, Gaul is like hill. So Galim is hills. And in modern colloquialism, it actually means tombstone because it means the place where you're buried. So basically, <laughs> damn, Galim could be read as like glittering death and your place of rest. It's yeah. Very interesting. And the person they chose to fight against the end was the pink ball of nothing. Oh, Kirby's well, seen in, worse. Yeah. That's in the book of revelation. So that's, that <laughs> tracks. That's yeah. <laughs> Look up Kirby Her lore sometime. He's done worse. I yeah, know he Kirby has. Actually, and Kirby I, a major ball I hate that Kirby, <laughs> The worst thing to me, too, is that Kirby has been the most effective. Like, I've tried playing as Mario and Donkey Kong, and generally, it's better for me to just stick with Kirby. Yeah, I think they call him Nintendo Jesus. I actually heard that Nintendo's planning on remaking The Passion of the Christ, but with Kirby as the as Jesus. Oh, uh, yeah. I'd probably pay to see that. I would definitely pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> That would be so funny. The Poyo of the Christ. Kirby's I hope it's true. Crimes. I hope all creation is just saved by a goofy little, a goofy little guy. I think that'd be funny. Maybe Kirby's yeah. supposed to represent us in all of our adorable naivete. Um, you just gotta wait till you unlock a true range character so you can just camp everyone out. I mean, like man. Samus. <laughs> So Sam is the, my in, the, in the Kirby subreddit, <laughs> this is a list of all That's of Kirby's good. crimes. In his first game, there's one count of forced entry, one count trespassing, one count treason, one count battery and assault, one, two counts of property damage, and one count of grand larceny. Um, was, Kirby kills God at some point. I'm trying to find <laughs> that. The Bible somewhere. <laughs> yeah, quote. <laughs> Genesis <laughs> chapter 6. Verse 8. <laughs> That's a short book. Yeah. It was all created, then Kirby um, came and messed it all up. <laughs> I love that. That's what Kirby we should do. Squeak is we squad. Should just... One count of trespassing, one count of battery and assault, one count of helping a prisoner <sighs> escape. Dude, Kirby Squeak Squad was fucking great. It was. Um. Oh my god. I remember. I totally forgot I had this game. Holy shit! That's the uh, first game I 100 percented, or at least the first one that had a progress meter that let me know 100 percented it. Are you serious, dude? That's so awesome. Um, 
Hang on, I'm trying to... I still haven't found Killing God. Let me let me try Googling Kirby Kills God. Did anyone here like ever... Exactly, God. What, James? Did anyone here ever play the Kirby racing game at all? I think it was for GameCube. Uh... Kirby, may, Kirby may have killed up to nine gods. Yeah. Um... Hang on. So it's starting to so become void clearer termina why. he killed, which is the only actual god, but multiple god level powers, such as Megolor and Star Dream. Um I think okay. Void Termina is the only god that uh Kirby has killed character was known as Popopo -po during development as the first game was planned to be titled Harukaze Popopo, -po, Spring Breeze Popopo, -po, or Popopo -po of the Spring Breeze. And he has such an elegant, they changed it. The name Kirby was chosen from a list of potential names provided by Nintendo of America. Shigeru Miyamoto stated that Kirby was chosen partly in honor of the American lawyer John Kirby, who defended Nintendo in the Universal City Studios Inc. versus Nintendo Company Limited Ace. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. Kirby kills a chaos god. Kirby is a space marine. <clears throat> oh my god. <laughs> well, he, he can be. He can be in, uh, uh, when, he, when he sucks in Samus, he can be. God damn. Be anything he wants. James, what are you recommending? Oh man, we've had Make it really quick. a gamut here. Uh, yeah, so I actually read this book a while ago. Um, it's one of the first books in a while because I usually read like heavier stuff. Uh, I, I like reading heavier stuff; it's fun, but it's really nice to read something that's just like still. Uh, it's got you know some kind of complexity and color to it, but it's just a straightforward story. And I read this book called Circe. Has anybody read this? Nope. 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 So it's a modern uh, retelling of Circe, her story, like the goddess, uh, or I should say the, the like sorceress. Is it Circe you know? or um, Circe? I say Circe is how I say it, but it could be Circe. I don't know. But I'm going to say Circe. Um, and it's awesome. It's honestly really good. Um, I, I read it because my stepmom, shout out, suggested it <laughs> and i was kind of like initially hesitant um because i didn't know if it was going to be like sometimes with modern reads when they're adapting you know greek source old old mythology because Circe is from ancient greek mythology yeah she's she most famously occurs in the odyssey when odysseus and his crew land on her island and he she turns all of his crew into pigs uh, except for him, and they basically, in the poem, I believe, they hang out for a while, like like her and Odysseus develop like a romantic uh, bond, and you know, but then eventually he has to leave. And the whole premise of the book is basically like, what if we just stuck with Cersei the whole time? What if we went from when she was a child all the way to wherever the story is going to end? You're going to have to find out how it ends when you read it. Uh, but really, really good. Super awesome uh, recontextualization of the character. This wonderful, vibrant, like, just reimaginative illustration of the woman, Circe. Uh, really loved uh, the world of Greek mythology that they sketched out. It feels like Percy Jackson meets Game of Thrones. It's hmm. very, very fun. Um, and... There's some romance arcs that happen very well. We get to see kind of Circe in all these different little episodes of her life. And there's some pretty great, like, long-term arcs that she has. It's really cool because it really does feel like... It's not a book that I would say necessarily has this, like, overwhelming arc. It kind of does in the sense that it has a beginning and an end. Things happen in the middle. There's a general shape. But it's not like there's this driving plot all the time. And I really love stories like that where we get to just hang out with our character and kind of, like overcoming little personal stuff or they're just kind of hanging out in a place and like doing stuff on their own. We get to see them grow and live. Um, it feels very true to life to me. So I would really recommend it. Uh, I devoured this book. I think I finished it in less than three days. Um, and it is like, it's like 
short-ish to mid-range. I think it's like 300-ish pages. Um, so I know I've got a couple people, a few people in here who regularly devour like massive tomes. So 300 you would be mid? able to get through it. What'd you say? I said 300 is mid? I mean, on the general public scale, yes. Like you could actually make the case that 300 is pushing the upper limits for most people. Um, Weak. Like for like size of book? Yeah, I would say. I mean, yeah, the don't New read Test fantasy then. <laughs> yeah, no, don't. I mean, the New Testament is only 230 pages, basically. So uh, it is. Is yeah, it? At least Damn. in the King James. Yeah. It in is. my mind, it's infinitely huh. large. Like I've never been able to like actually fully sit down and read it. It's so. It takes. Well, it, there. It is the small text. I believe the general public can read longer books, uh, because the seventh Harry Potter book which plenty of people read, is 759 pages. Yeah, that's the end of a, of a seven-part mega series that have a yeah. global momentum. RJ finished it. it in 11 hours. That's pretty impressive. As How old were you? You We were probably like... 13 or so. Uh, what year did it uh, come out? Uh, no, it, I think it came out before... Before high school. We were in seventh grade. Really? Yeah. Not to date us. <laughs> uh oh. Old. Reveal our ages. Um, but yeah, I believe it was 2011 or 2010. Yeah. That's what that's what Wikipedia says. Uh, so I was like uh, November 12, 13. 19. Yeah. No, Deathly yeah. Hollows. No, the the book. Yeah. Oh, that's the movie. Oh shit. Yeah, it's one 2007. Oh, right. Holy so I was like ten. Yeah, I was about to say I, I this came out when like when I was in elementary school, I just could have sworn. Really? Yeah. yeah. Two thousand seven. Yeah, that tracks. It, oh, we would have I didn't know you guys then. I didn't think I didn't know you guys. It I and think... the first edition was six hundred pages. There's an epilogue. That would have I been I think that includes it. Look I feel like that I'm was... telling you. First edition can't have been 600 pages because I got it hot off the presses day one. And that's the copy sitting on my shelf. Yeah, this is like, this is either, I think this is literally, Calvin, I think this came out right before we met you. Like, I, I 21st I July say, 2007. We met fall of 2008. In, was it? Was that when we started yep. middle school? Yep. Shit. No. Damn, We're yep. young. I'm still young. Ah. <laughs> um, no, I meant it. We are young. <laughs> well, we're not yeah, that young. Relative. We're well, we're old for twenty, but we're young for everything else. That's but why. we're we're re it's it's statistically it's time for a midlife crisis. What do you mean time? What do you mean I yeah. haven't already been going through it? <laughs> Where exactly. have you been, Calvin? Yeah, <laughs> that's my point. Get with the program. I've been having my own midlife crisis. God, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. I've been thinking about you people all the time. <laughs> Got my own existential horrors to deal with. Yay! <laughs> Get out the carousel. Woo <laughs> you can't. You can check into the rave, but you can never leave. That's what we need. We need. Uh, we need a rave remix of Hotel California. There has to be at least one. There's no way it doesn't exist. Yeah, um, that has to exist. Yeah, that would be my living hell. <laughs> like <laughs> That's the house the mix. Yeah, like a house mix, like whatever. Yeah, like a house or uh, yeah, like deep house or, or a trap, electronic. I don't know about trap necessarily, um, okay. but it could still work. Oh, there's yeah, a club really quick, remix. I sorry, go I, ahead. No, no, no. <laughs> a club would a club would be would be fitting as well. Uh, I I just want to recommend Cersei. I would say check it out. Wonderful book. Uh, would definitely recommend more. I want to say it's written by Madeline Miller. Yes, Madeline Miller. Um, she wrote another book called The Song of Achilles, which I'm like totally down to read at this point. But please check it out. So much fun. So cool. Uh, really, really great Like taste of modern and classic mixed into one. It's very hard to find somebody who can do that well uh, in the way that she does it. And I just loved her characters. I loved her world. I loved her story. I loved her voice. Um, also, uh, yeah, yeah. I loved Cersei. I thought she was awesome. So go check it out. Now back to your 
regularly oh, yeah. scheduled existential crisis. Yeah. Well, we're going a little long today, but uh, fuck it. I have been using the same show notes for one, two, three, uh, four, five, five weeks. Same show notes haven't changed. Uh. We're gonna we're gonna answer at least one advice question. Uh, so, how to be a better buddy? Where we give some real and some humorous advice. How can I help advocate men's mental health? With the further details. Hello. So, as you guys probably know, men- men's mental health is something that doesn't get talked about nearly as much as it should. Which, frankly, considering the last like three years, I think a lot of people are saying that. Which sounds like they're talking about it. Uh, but how can I, a 19-year-old male, make a change? Well, so. can, given the last three years, we've proven that a global pandemic may start some conversations. So you could try that. And you could start a global pandemic, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah as Anne Rand would say, like, figure guys, out yourself, bro. Guys, I got the news today that the World Health Organization is up to virus I'd never heard of to emergency level, like global emergency level. Let's not make pandemic jokes before the second pandemic. Oh, you're Which serious. Okay. <laughs> Which one is this? I'd have to look it up. I Don't they Probably. often do that, actually, though? That's what I thought. I like it's M-Pox. like weather. You know what I mean? M-Pox. Is that, is that the renaming yeah, of uh, Monkeypox? Yes, it is. A global health oh. emergency. International well, I, concern. I apologize for my cavalierness about Oh, uh, hang on. Starting a global pandemic. It's not It's not a good thing in any context, especially when <laughs> there is I potentially mean, one on the horizon. I mean, we can, I think with some slight distance, we can all admit. The I, disease I, is already considered endemic to countries in Central and West Africa, and this has not been a new virus. It's been around since 1970. No. I'd also like to say, I mean, that, like, I think it maybe this is detached to detached perspective, but there were some farcical, near comical elements of COVID. Like, there, like, not the disease itself, nor what it did to people, but some of the responses and sort of the uh, the episodes that we got from it. I feel were I feel like everybody kind of had guys. A, a sort of, guys, we're gonna be safe. Yeah. We don't have to worry. It spread through sex. Why? It oh, spread through goodness. sexual contact. We're all safe. Don't worry. I, I had. Cool. To me, and also I cut my dick off. That's great. That's good news for me. <laughs> is is it only contact through genitals though, or is it contact? Through no, genitals? I think that's just the most common. Uh, way. It's spread mainly through sexual networks. So yes, as Calvin said, most common, but not restricted to. Uh, I I would say I like to address the original prompt or question i would say like the, the question was what basically like how do i deal with this or how do i make uh, people it was more okay prepared? people don't uh generally talk about men's mental health how can a 19 year old man make the chain make a change in the conversation on mental health and frankly start talking about it but don't be an yeah. asshole you know the difference yeah. you've seen the difference listen up kid you know those guys the ones who are like, oh, how dare men be drafted? How dare me- uh, nobody cares about men's depression? Like, you can't be like pity party, fuck everybody else for being talked about. That's not how power works. That just makes you an asshole. But that is how power works. That's what it makes you. <laughs> well, that's how part of power. That's how a very short term. I gotta go uh, dig up that author on power dynamics. I, in grad school i remember reading like a, the first chapter of a book for assigned reading that was like the guy in it was basically like yeah it, when the oppressed uh, lose the when the oppressed stop being oppressed that's the critical moment where they need to be like hey let's do better and not become the oppressor that's just red rising wow. rj <laughs> yeah just read red rising I, I mean, I would say too. I think like uh, RJ, like uh, RJ's points is is well taken as well. Where it's like, yeah, don't, don't, uh, don't be like a dick. The problem, 
Yeah, and the problem with like mental health type stuff is that like when you start to ground anything in uh like divisive language and that doesn't have to necessarily be like charged divisive language like it can just be you can literally just be classifying it even classifying it as men's mental health like just talk about the implication could be that when you're talking about it you could talk for instance about statistics that may affect men more and then like if you're giving a presentation then also like give a balanced perspective give find statistics, you may learn something. You may learn about the interdependency or uh, a correlation between specific mental health situations that women are forced into and specific mental health situations that men are forced into. Because like ultimately the goal is not to get like one group healthy and the other not. Like the goal is to improve all mental health, I would think. So if you yeah. approach it from a balanced perspective while saying like, I do care about men's mental health because I'm a man, I feel like, you know, men have not always done the best job at, funnily enough, either standing up for themselves or being honest enough with them or other people about how they feel or thinking about why they feel those ways. And I do think, like, I, I hate to say it necessarily, but I, I do, I am a little bit of a, of a devotee or an adherent to the kind of traditional masculinity. Like, I do think sometimes part of life, not just part of being a man, but part of life is, like, Kind of scraping your teeth and getting through it. Sometimes that is like sometimes there's no explanation, there's no words as, uh, or idea. As I told you my gotta... therapist back in like April, I am this close to being out of the woods. So for the next like three weeks, I'm just gonna white knuckle my mental health, and then we could start working on it again. Yeah, I, I mean, like sometimes you gotta go. Like my dad has a phrase that he throws out often, and he says, you know, everyone has got to walk in the desert, and. Sometimes you do. Sometimes, I, I hate to say it, there is nothing that will help. Like, there's no technique, there's no idea, there's no person. There's nothing you can put in your body or, or take out of your body. Like, it's just a condition a of life. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it's, it's... Well, I, I say choice. I mean, like, it's the choice to continue forward, right? To, yeah. Ex yeah, we just yeah, gotta get well, up to the next day, go through the day, do the next day. Well said. And, like, I, I do want to clarify this heavily with, like, that does not mean that, like, this should be a constant state. Like, you should not just be, like, you know, like, you can't just not think about stuff or ignore your emotions. Like, you need to have periods of introspection and you need to have periods where you think about this stuff. And if you have a it's really strategic. serious episode. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's, like... It's something that we do naturally, but because we're kind of often in artificial circumstances or contexts in social settings and we spend most of our lives in social settings, it can be very difficult to kind of tap into what we're actually feeling and, and, and you know, have uh, let us get some breathing room to think about it. So long story short, like take a balanced approach. Know that sometimes you're just going to have to like do that walk in the desert. A little bit of white knuckling is kind of a part of life. But also understand that, like, yeah, like, make your own oases, like, take take some time, find ways to, like, think about, you know, why you feel, you know, what you feel, or feel stuff about what you think, like, always be playing with it, you know, and, and just, like, be, think. You also you, gotta make sure you, you make those spaces for your friends, too, right? Like, yeah, yeah. be willing to talk with your friends about, like, hey, how's your mental health doing? Are you doing okay? Do you want advice or just to vent? Because the more yeah, you can so. have those conversations, and it doesn't have to be all the time, but like every so often do that check-in and be honest about your own situation of, I'm not doing so good today, or I'm doing pretty good today, and I, I recognize that. Uh, yeah. Or, you know, go start a nonprofit foundation and like put it, do, dedicate your life to it. Uh, do, do whatever the fuck you want. These are the two choices. Yeah. <laughs> In every man, there is two wolves. <laughs> yeah, there are two wolves. <laughs> Start a nonprofit or just talk to your friends. All right, I think that's enough fiddle faddle out of us this week. Thank you all for joining. Man. Thank you. I have to ask really quick: do you do you, uh, uh, any any words for two fifty? Um, gonna be honest. Back when we started this shit show. I didn't think we'd ever get to 250. I'm mapped out to do uh, past 250. 
but I, I was never fully sure we'd, we'd actually make it this far. Because, you know, this is what, almost five years? Give it a, hang on, give it four, eight, give it like ten weeks. Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, literally <laughs> ten weeks. 260 is our five-year anniversary. Is that oh. the conclusion of season one, then? No. You'll know it when I tell you. <laughs> you don't get God, out bad that easy, you? bastard. The ride never ends, James. Don't worry. The ride never ends. <laughs> Woo hoo! Because then never getting out of here. There is no freedom. Because next is season two. Wow. We burn <laughs> all good or buddy season one out of a VHS tape and sell it for like three million dollars, or just I wish. It somewhere. We'll launch it into we space. Yeah, we should launch it into space, or we should make, like, a cardboard, like, Ark of the Covenant carrier for it, carry it around. Uh, but there yeah, I'm, I'm glad we made it to 250. I'm glad you all are here with me still, this these five years later. Um, and I'm thankful to everybody who's helped along the way and been on episodes, because there definitely were a few close calls every so often where it'd be like, ah, shit, can anybody, like, give me an hour of their time, please? I'm begging you. <laughs> Please. Please. But yeah. Uh, thank you all for joining. Thank you to the band Problem of Interest for still letting us use the song Living in the Moment off the album Cross Off yesterday. You can find them on iTunes and Spotify. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are sold. We're also on social media. Our Facebook is Better Buddies. Our X account is at BetterBudcast. Use the hashtag BetterBuddies when you tweet about the show. I still don't know what word they use now that they can't, they don't, they're not Twitter. Uh, or our X. Gmail is BetterBuddiesCast at gmail.com. You can send us fan art, hate art, fan mail, hate mail, declarations of love, and or war, icebergs you want us to answer, or questions you need advice on. We're also on YouTube, where we post clips of the show when I remember to do that. More are coming, and if there's any clips in particular you'd like to see, please let us know at our Gmail, which I just talked about. And last but not least, be a better buddy. I Hi, lost. Hi, James. Thanks for giving me the win. Win? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wait, that I uh, was going to show up later than five minutes. No, oh, no, we have a surprise. We have What's a surprise for you. It's uh, a surprise! Yeah, you'll find out in a few minutes. You're not allowed to know. Oh, I'm excited. I'm a little nervous, but I'm excited. You should be nervous. Congratulations, <laughs> you're getting a vasectomy. Yep, surprise vasectomy. The doctor's in your closet. Right outside your door. <laughs>